All members of the council are present. Uh, in addition, Mr. Sutherland, the uh, city administrator is present, and Ms. Hughes, the city clerk, to record the meeting is present. If you would all join the city council in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So uh, the first thing that's up is I have a, uh, a proclamation, that is the city of Saco wishes to recognize the accomplishments of the New England Electric Rail Railway Historic Society doing business as Seashore Trolley Museum located in Kennebunk, Arundel, and Biddeford on its 80th anniversary. The museum began as a global streetcar preservation movement on July 5th, 1939, when the founders purchased Car 31 from the Biddeford Saco Railroad and brought it to Kennebunk Port. In the 1940s through the 1960s, the collection grew to include both New England country trolleys and city cars, significant national and international cars, trackless trolleys, and buses. Whereas over one million people have visited the museum from around the country and the world, the museum has become an, an educational historic, historical uh, institution and a respected res resource in the transportation and the transit industry. And since its inception has expanded to over 1,000 members and over 300 historic railway and public transportation vehicles preserved. The efforts and dedication of the volunteers and the staff of the, rail, of the museum over the years has demonstrated the extraordinary vision and, pres and preserved the history of trolleys in a manner that educates the public. The city of Saco is honored to have such a valuable resource and historic asset in our community. Now, therefore, I, Marston Level Mayor of Saco, Maine, do hereby declare in, this, this, in the city of Saco July, at July 2019 is Seashore Trolley Museum Month. In witness thereof, I have signed my hand. <clears throat> so, um, that having been said, general, under public comments, I see Mr. Scheiman is present. If you would like to come forward and speak uh, relative to the school board. Well, if it's not, speak loudly. Oh, it's on public. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, um, we did have a. Um, a finance meeting um, in which we discussed things of how we're going to handle the budget vis-a-vis -vis the um, what the council had amended um, and uh, we have a meeting Wednesday um, which we'll discuss this further in the, with the um, with the full board um, we did have an issue um, which you I think you're aware of with the um, auditor because of the way it was set up it gives us a bit of a problem but we'll survive that one. Um, but we, and in, in the realistic things, in terms of what we have to do on the budget, there were some options that, uh, um, there was leadership uh, made their suggestions about, I'm talking about school leadership, about uh, how to handle it. And, uh, and then uh, there was some discussion in the finance meeting that we had. Um, and as I said, it'll be more on Wednesday. So, um, and other things that I can't discuss that have to do with things with executive session and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. From Mayor Pryline, do you want to step forward? State your name and address for the record, please. Uh, Don Pylon, 16 Glen Haven Circle. Um, last week, um, the um, people of Saco voted on the school budget 
and um, it was a very poor turnout. It was approximately 3.8% of the registered voters in town that <coughs> came out and voted on the uh, school budget. And as you look back and you think, why was there such a low turnout? What could we have done better to get the vote out? Now, maybe some of you may say, well, that's, now other towns had the same experience. Well, frankly, I don't care about other towns. What could Saco have done better to get the vote out? One suggestion that somebody made to me is the banner hanging in the center of town. We hang banners all the time in the center of town announcing the Greek festival, and I think there's one up now for uh, an event on Main Street. And, but we hang banners all the time. And, and, and as you know, there's a lot of traffic going down Main Street. Um, and it's always backed up. And it's a great time to sit there and read the banner, or a banner. A banner that's hanging up now costs $600. When the council was, when the council was um, appropriating surplus funds recently, the council gave $500 to the American Red Cross, $1,500 to another, for another uh, nonprofit, and so on down the line. <coughs> Don't you think it would have been wise to perhaps invest $600 of surplus funds to get a banner? There's no banner. We don't have a banner to put up every time there's a, a vote to be taken. So I kind of scratch my head and say, well, maybe this is a good, maybe this is what the council and maybe the school board wanted, a low turnout. It would work in their favor to have a low turnout. We could do better and we should do better as public officials to get the vote out. So I would urge the council and the school board, next time we have some surplus funds, don't give it to the Red Cross, $500. You could buy a banner for that. Old Orchard Beach had a banner. Gorham had a banner. Think about what's good for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Barbara, step forward, please. State your name and address for the record. Barbara Coleman, 45B East Dockman Avenue. First, I'm going to address the contract zone agreement that you guys are going to have your first hearing of tonight. I have watched this through, I think, now four years. The same individual, Chamberlain, coming before us, the company, or however you want to put it, and asking for various things from the council. It's been proved since, I believe, 2005. And if you look at the chart in the council packet, look at your three columns. It's a third completed in one, a third completed in the middle, and a third uncompleted totally. <clears throat> so you've got basically two thirds of the contract zone agreement, not even in completion, and only one third of it completed. And to whose advantage? Is it to the city or is it to the developer. You are to make that decision for yourselves. I just saw it as an observation. Now, Mayor, this is directed directly at you, Mayor. I have watched council meetings from home, and I have been in attendance. I have watched several times how you, over the course of the last several months, how you have spoken to several councilors. Specifically, when they're trying to ask a question, and you immediately jump and say, oh, I'll have the city manager, administrator answer the question, or I'll pull so-and-so to answer the question. You don't know what the question is yet. So please allow that counselor, and I'm looking at the counselor right now that gets the most problems because she, and I state that, is attempting to learn. She's new to the council. She doesn't have all the years experience as other people do. And it's a learning curve, just like I learned about TIFFs 
from sitting here for four years. I, get, I understand the basics of them. So would you please allow your council members to ask their questions before you answer to who they should be going to? Second, the three minute rule. It's amazing how I am cut off at the three minute rule. Mr. Hawkins is cut off at the three minute rule, but he's not here tonight. But I've watched repeatedly where you have allowed other individuals to speak for five to seven minutes and did not shut them down. That to me is favoritism. You either follow the three minute rule for all, at least let them get out their sentence, or don't be consistent at all. One or the other because it's not fair to the people who are attending every week to try to make a difference in this municipality. And we are. You know, there are comments and stuff like that that we want to make heard. There, you know, if I wasn't persistent about the senior program, would Councilor Menthon had been able to lead a committee to bring not one, but two programs that increased for seniors. So yes, I've gone over the three minute mark. Gonna cut me off? Or do I get to finish to say? Last comment. And I know this is difficult, and it's not directed to you, but it's directly at technology. I recognize that you need to turn to your left and to your right or whatever to speak to your council. We cannot hear you when you're speaking over there because your mic is over there. I would ask that someone please purchase you a lapel mic so that we all can hear you. <coughs> and that is not a criticism of you. It is the criticism of that the system should have had that from the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is the consent agenda. Um, before I ask for a motion, uh, one of the things I would like to ask um, is that uh, Councilor remove item E, the disposition of foreclosed properties. Specifically, it's property owned by the Bank of America. Uh, we can certainly allow the liens to accumulate on that. The Bank of America probably will sell the property more effectively than the city of Saco will and will collect on the liens at that time rather than foreclose and go for uh, the problems of trying to sell the property ourselves. So may I have a motion uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, let me see, can I have a motion on, on putting the consent agenda on the floor? So moved. Second. So I have a motion by Councilor Copeland, seconded by Councilor Smart. Um, is there any comments to my right on uh, the consent agenda, removing anything from the consent agenda? None. On my left, seeing none. So you would like item E removed, is this what we understand? Yes. Okay, I make that motion. Second. Sir. Okay, so item E is removed uh, from the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda consists of A through D. Uh, any other comments to my left? Yeah. Sir. Got a vote. Say again? Got a vote to remove that. Yeah, no. Oh, we have to, no we don't. Actually, uh, the, the tradition of the council has been if a councilor wishes to remove, it actually doesn't need a second. It gets to be read and there's a second for on, on the reading of it. But that removing is the is within the purview of any individual counselor. So um, nothing else. So uh, this is on items A through D. Um, no comments have been made. Councilor Johnston. Yes. Councilor Smart. Yes. Councilor Minthorn. Yes. Councilor Copeland. Yes. And Councilor uh, Doyle. Yes. Councilor Gay. Yes. And Councilor Archer. Yes. Uh, the motion to pass the consent agenda passes 7-0 with the exception of item E of the consent agenda. Item E of the consent agenda, Councilor Archer, um, would you make that motion? The city foreclosed on several properties on January 19, 2019. Many attempts have been made to get the property owners to pay. <coughs> 
either pay off the uh, matured tax liens or entered into an option agreement and remain current with them. All attempts were unsuccessful. Uh, be it ordered that City Council authorize the Finance Director to write off the delinquent tax amount for 19 Market Street and remove it from the tax rolls, and further move to authorize the City Administrator to dispose of the tax acquired property at 19 Market Street. I move to approve the order. Second. So I have a motion by Councilor Archer, seconded by Councilor Gay. My only comment there is that if we leave it with Bank of America, they're more likely to effectively sell this. So any comments to my right? Any comments to my left? Councilor Smart. Question, um, is, is there any utility to that property directly with the city keeping it? With the city actually holding on to that property, Mr. Sutherland? No, there is not. There's no utility to, this, to that property. Thank you. Any other comments to my left? Again, to my right. Thank you. The motion is to uh, foreclose on this property. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Gay? Yes. Councilor Doyle? No. Councilor Copeland? No. No. Thank you. Councilor, <laughs> Councilor Menthorn? No. Councilor Smart? No. And Councilor <coughs> Johnston? No. So the motion fails 5-2. Uh, the city will not foreclose on this property, and we will depend on the Bank of America uh, doing their best to sell it at a really good price, and then we will collect all of the property tax liens at that time. So the first item on the agenda is the uh, table motion <coughs> on uh, the first reading of the Park North Contract Zone amendments. Uh, Councillor Gay. Elliot Chamberlain, applicant, had requested a contract zone amendment to add at uses of offices, contracts, and tradesmen and contractors to the Park North contract zone tradesmen. Development LLC in Peterson Properties LLC and the City of Saco dated December 20th, 2005, amended through October 17, 2016. At their meeting on March 19, 2019, the Planning Board reviewed the contract zone amendment requested and forwarded a positive recommendation to the City Council. I move to take from the table Park North contract zone amendment. Thank you. Do I have a second on this first motion? Second. So I have a motion by Councillor Gay, seconded by Councillor Doyle to remove the Park North contract zone amendment from the table. Any com uh, It's we're moving from the table. I don't think there's comment there. So, Councillor Archer? No. Councillor Gay? Yes. Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Copeland? Yes. Councillor Mentorn? Yes. Councillor Smart? Yes. And Councillor Johnston? No. So the motion passes 5-2. It is now removed from the table. Councillor Gay, may I have the second motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve the first reading of Park North Contract Zone Amendment and further move to schedule a public hearing on this item at the July 15, 2019 meeting. Do I have a second on this motion? Second. So again, Councillor Doyle has made a motion. Councillor Kay has made a motion. Councillor Doyle has seconded that motion, which is to approve that the, uh, the first reading and to uh, move the public hearing to July 15th. Happy July 1st. July 1st. Uh, so, Councillor Gay, uh, are, you willing to, uh, are you willing to amend your motion so that, it, so that the public hearing would occur on July 1st? Yes, sir. And, Councillor Doyle, do you accept that amendment? Yes. So, the motion uh, reads, I move to approve the first reading of the Park North Contract Zone Amendment and further move to schedule a public hearing on this item on the 1st of July, 20, uh, 2019. Any comments on this motion to my right? Council, uh, Mr. Sutherland, yes. I just wanna say the reason I'm asking for that is because July 15th is scheduled to be a workshop, not a, not a full council meeting, so. Okay. 
currently? Uh, I think the 15th was scheduled for this particularly, uh, particular item because uh, I think August 12th is the next meeting and we have a 30-day clock on this. That's what I remember. Winner. So <laughs> let me go back to Councillor Gay and Councillor Doyle and ask if it's all right we, if we return to July 15th as a public hearing date. Um, yes. Local. Councilor Gay. Yes. All right, thank you. So the motion <laughs> returns to the original motion, and it will be July 15th. So uh, any comments to my right? Seeing none. Comments to my left? Seeing none. So the motion is to approve the first reading and move this to a public hearing for July 15th. Councilor Johnston. No. Councillor Smart. Yes. Councillor Minthorn. Yes. Councillor Copeland. No. Oh, okay. Uh, Councillor Doyle. Yes. Councillor Gay. Yes. And Councillor Archer. No. So the motion passes. Ooh, four, three. All right. And that was the non-controversial one. The next one up is item B. Councillor Johnston, do you have a motion associated with item B? Um, if it's all right, I'm going to allow Councillor Doyle to take this since it's oh. in his ward. Oh, excuse me. Yes, sir. Would you take this motion, uh, Councillor Doyle? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. City Council had asked at the November 13th, 2018 workshop that the eight amendments to Park North subdivision previously approved by the Planning Board be brought to the City Council for review. Recently, the Planning Board conditionally approved the ninth amendment to create one additional lot from the parcel currently addressed at 4 Cascade Road. For the Council's review, the following is a description of the eight amendments to the Park North subdivision approved by the Planning Board to date. First Amendment. Division of Lot C1 resulting in the creation of Lot C5 at the corner of Cascade Road and Route 1 approved 1-22-2008. <clears throat> Second Amendment. Further division of Lot C1 resulting in the creation of Lot C6 approved 1-20-2009. Applicant Wagner Drywall received site plan approval for the commercial building that now houses a daycare and other uses. Third Amendment, creation of lots C4A, C4B, and 22. The latter was carved out of the existing lot 18 at the corner of Portland Road and Main Road, now Waterfall Drive, and is now occupied by the former Ocean Communities Credit Union building. Lots C4A and C4B were created from the existing parcel that lies between Cascade Road and Old Cascade Road. It is described in the parcel deed for the Cascade Inn as a separate parcel from the larger former inn property. Zones C4A and C4B have since been developed with single family dwellings. Fourth Amendment, easements associated with a force main and pump station for lots C1, C5, and C6 were created. Fifth Amendment, updating dimensional regulations in parcels two, three, and four of the contract zone agreement. The space and bulk regulations in Parcel 4 necessitated a change to the subdivision plan for Parcel 4. Sixth Amendment modified the residential area of Lot 18. Seventh Amendment, the first part proposes to alter Phase 3 and 5 within the residential portion of the development which will consider, excuse me, will consist of consolidating the proposed right-of-way of Bears Den Road not currently built. The previous proposed open space, one, lot C4 and lot C5 to accommodate 17 duplexes. The second part proposes to subdivide lot 18 at the corner of Waterfall Drive and Portland Road to, cre to create an approximate six acre parcel for future development of a 72 unit apartment building. Eighth Amendment. This amendment consolidates lots six through 15 located in the northeastern portion of the parcel. The previously proposed right-of-way for Minor Park Road, the previously proposed right-of-way for approximately 1,100 feet of Don Marie Drive, and the parcel formerly containing stormwater detention area two. The purpose of this change is to accommodate the outsale of approximately 27.52 acres to Maine State Department of Defense. As a result of this outsale, 
it is necessary to reconfigure the roadway alignments and intersection of Don Marie Drive and Eastview Parkway. Additionally, former Lot 5 and the parcel containing Stormwater Detention Area 1 are proposed to be adjusted. In conjunction with these changes, the applicant is proposing to subdivide Lots 2 through 4 to create six lots. Ninth Amendment, this amendment creates one additional lot from 4 Cascade Road. The applicant has submitted a site plan application for construction of a 6,000 square foot mixed use structure, 3,000 square foot business use, and 3,000 square foot medical office. Staff recommends approval of the above subdivision amendments based on actions by the planning board from 2008 to present. I move to approve the first reading of Park North Contract Zone subdivision amendments and to schedule a public hearing on July 15, 2019 for the Park North Contract Zone subdivision amendments as enumerated above. Thank you very much. Do I have a second on this motion? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Councillor Mentorn. I have a motion by Councillor Doyle, seconded by Councillor Mentorn. To approve a first reading of the, to approve a first reading of the Park North Contract Zone sub, subdivision amendments, and schedule a public hearing for July fifteenth, two thousand nineteen. Any comments to my right? <coughs> Seeing none. Any comments to my left? Councillor Johnston. I have a question, sir. Since we're essentially proving these after the fact. What does that mean going forward if we were to say not approve them? So th many of these are already <clears throat> been completed, some of the projects that have been tied to this, under the assumption that the planning board had the authority to do so. In council discussion back in, in December and then again this past month in um, workshop, we talked about how many of these have to be approved just as a matter of process uh, because we've interpreted the ordinance to supersede the contract itself. So this is a retroactive approval. Going forward, any future lot line changes would have to come before the council related to this contract zone. Uh, and I believe the Ninth Amendment is actually still in, it's, it's contingent on the council's approval of it. So if, if the council were to say, we want to approve, we don't want to approve the ninth one, I would still recommend that you approve the first through the eighth. Okay, well, my concern, as I stated to you previously, is the eighth amendment, and I'm a little concerned that the planning board approved this when there's no allowed uses in the subdivision for the Army National Guard, which is my understanding who now owns the property. So how did this get through planning is really my concern because you would have thought that they would have recognized that there's no uses allowed in parcel two that are government related outside of municipal, but specifically military related. I'm, I'm you'd, not, have, I, you'd have to ask for another amendment to the contract zone to allow this, this use. I'm, it's unclear to me whether or not you can regulate where federal government decides to put its buildings. That's a state government agency. Yeah. National Guard is not federal. It's owned by the, the main Department of Defense. I'm, our attorney is here by happenstance, and maybe he can provide, shed some light on this or provide some additional comment in the future. Um, I, I, sure, in, in the attorney, future is fine. Attorney Murphy, would you be able to come forward? You don't have to respond right now, Tim. I just... <laughs> I, can you respond at all to... Um, to I guess this is the Ninth Amendment and the, this, uh, this is the Eighth, eighth amendment. amendment. And in this particular case, or do you want to read the amendment? So the eighth, uh, in this particular so case, the Army National Guard owns a, a lot within uh, the Park North uh, contract zone. And they also own an adjacent lot in, um, in Scarborough, and they are planning to build on it. Okay, so, so uh, let me break the comments in essentially sort of two categories. I learned, I don't know, probably six to eight months ago that the National Guard was and had purchased land um, 
and I don't remember if it was Zach who brought it up or Joe Laverrier, but we, the three of us, Zach Mosier, Joe Laverrier, and myself, started engaging in a little bit of a dialogue about uh, what we viewed as uh, amendments to the contract zone uh, by uh, Mr. Chamberlain and Park North that had not yet sort of seen the light of day. And the question was whether some of these were actually should have come to you to be reviewed or not. Um, my opinion back then, and it probably remains the same, although I haven't really looked at it carefully, uh, is that that's a significant change in use. And the easy way to frame it is this. Had, had the developer come to you initially back in 2007, 2008, and said, I have this huge 300-acre project that you, the city, view as some of the most valuable real estate on US Route 1, where your tax revenue base is located, but I want you to devote maybe 50 acres of it to non-taxable use, I suspect all of you probably would have had some significant questions with regard to that. It probably wouldn't have passed the council, it might not well have passed the council, if it had been brought up back in 2007. Um, so I, I think the very fact that you can go through that kind of question tells you it must be, uh, and arguably is a change in use uh, that, that should have been brought to you. So that's on the one hand. On the second hand, the history has had, the, the city has had a long history of working cooperatively with our common uh, carrier utilities such as CMP, uh, Northern Utilities for Gas. We rely upon them, they rely upon us, Verizon, about having that relationship. Similarly, we've worked well with the state of Maine. We are a frequent applicant to the state for grants. We frequently work with state departments on rights of way and common interests. So while yes, we're likely to lose some tax revenue, and while perhaps this may well have been something that should have come to you, now that the developer has initiated the sale, uh, and, it, and since it's to an to the state, a fellow sovereign, to accomplish important state ends. I, as your counsel, I wouldn't recommend that this is a, 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 you know, a hunt that we ought to be going on, and that there's, there's greater wisdom sometimes to turning the other cheek, as the Bible would say, that this, is, this may be one that we let lie. Uh, that's for the wisdom of you, not for me, because it ultimately becomes a policy call. But I, I think it's something that, sh certainly if I were, had been the buyer of the property, I would have come to you and said, gee, uh, city, uh, I don't see that this is expressly permitted in this contract zone, and could you give us a legal opinion or let us know how you feel? Uh, that was never done. So th there may be some blame to go around, but I I'm not sure it's something you really want to pick that. Pick so, up that. Attorney Murphy, a little background there. It apparently is a piece of property that was sold to the University of New England. First. And the University of New England traded it for a parcel on Stevens Avenue owned by the National Guard. Yep. So you're familiar with that aspect? I've heard of that step oh. in the, the interim step, and I, I don't know why that sort of mechanics occurred, but it would make no difference. The University of New England was itself a nonprofit, was except, I doubt schools are permitted use in that zone. And my sense is if it was ever investigated, I don't think they were ever really intended to be a long-term owner. I think there was some sort of a re arrangement where the University of New England was a pass-through to the state of Maine. But I don't know that for sure. I, but. I would agree. And, and that's my concern is that you, if you look at the deeds, the UNE bought this and held it for three months and flipped it to the Maine National Guard. So to me, it seems like it was a yeah. backroom deal all along. Right. And meanwhile, the city's losing 27 acres that are directly in the middle of a TIF district. So, I mean, I, I get the, the idea that maybe we don't want to fight it, but it just, it's part of the overall larger picture of this particular property to begin with. And the fact that this, you didn't find out about it until six months ago when I as a counselor knew in 2015, 
it's concerning that the planning board or the planner, nobody thought to, to ask the city's attorney. I, well, I think you see that out at Park North, there were a number of changes coming forward. And, and to your credit, you have been bringing the developer in and holding his feet to the fire on requested changes. So uh, I think it's a different message that's now gone on out there. But the die is probably cast as to... <coughs> Well, again, I'm extremely disappointed. It's 27 acres on parcel number two, which was specifically zoned for uses. That really is why, as, as you indicated, the council approved this in 2005. It was a mixed-use subdivision, not whatever the Army National Guard or Maine National Guard ultimately decides to do with that. I would be hesitant to think that the people that bought property, particularly condos and houses right across the stream there, would be pleased to find out they might have a military use for the property. So let me just say at this point, I have some information that says that the design and planning associated with that, with their intended use, has yet to begin, but will beginning, will be beginning in a just a couple of months or so. Do we have a motion? I still have, I have questions. No, okay, no, Councilor Copeland. So we have, is this in the opportunity zone as yes, well? Ma'am, it is. Right, so this is the, it's right in, on the border with Scarborough. So it's in the opportunity zone, it's in a contract zone. Um, we are learning that contract zones don't typically, and I assume this one does not, allow nonprofits in there. So we're taking this primo tax. So what I'm thinking is all of the people who are trying to help reduce their taxes by putting businesses in, and this is like prime time, opportunity zone, contract zone, build it out, and we're just gonna be a good neighbor. Well. I Why, how did, is this, is this kind of like the uh, title and rent thing, uh, where, why was it sold to a nonprofit? Well, that, the original sale was to a nonprofit. So, Attorney Murphy, do you have any I, sort of response you can the, give? All Council I Copeland? heard, and, and this is urban legend, was the um, <laughs> schools wanted to make a trade to secure some land that was held by the guard. Right. They then purchased this land so that the guard could move. The guard then... But this just happened recently, this kind of yeah. maneuver. So yeah. the city purchases the um, city the didn't purchase park. anything. We didn't, this is not in the business park. This is at right. the end of So it's a contract zone, but it's not a business on park? The east, it's on the east yeah. side of Route 1 at the far end of the community. So up against Old Orchard Beach, up against Scarborough, that portion of the city is owned privately. This is not a city-owned parcel being sold. This was a privately okay. s private sale. Well, and, and parcels, so parcels can produce taxes. They can also produce visitors. So we don't know how many hundreds of guards people will come to that site come to our community, spend money at the movie theater or at Funtown or at a gas station or a restaurant. So, but will it maximize the benefits? No, and Nathan brought up, uh, Councilor Johnson brought up a good point about the neighbors. So, but I, I, it's in a, it's in a opportunity zone anyway, and it's in a contract zone for business. So, I don't know, this is just, uh, I mean, it's, as I said before, it's specifically in the largest parcel that when you look at those uses that we just did for parcel two, it has, well, if we approve the next amendment, it's going to have 39 commercial uses, really. And now we're taking the largest parcel out and leaving eight lots. So is this... Somebody's getting feedback, right? So um, to add to Attorney Murphy's urban legend, uh, the National Guard owns um, a, a, a land adjacent to what was Westbrook College, 
which is now UNE, and that was, that's why they're interested. They, they bought one piece from the National Guard, where, which now houses part of their Westbrook hmm. campus, and they're looking for this other piece so that they own the entirety of that. Councilor Menthorne, and then Councilor Smart. Tim, would this fall under the designation of quasi-public use or municipal uses that we're seeing as permitted uses in parcel two? Quasi-public, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it's a stretch, but. Okay, Councilor. So, Councilor, it depends on what side of the table I'm sitting on and how yeah. creative I would need to be. Yeah. Okay. So, Councilor Smart. I, I'm just wondering um, if you can comment on, on your views of any sort of liability that the city would be taking on if they, if we didn't approve these uses that have sort of been acted upon already. Uh, standing here, I, I kind of, I'd be giving you something off the top of my head. Anybody that went in without consulting with planning board may have done so at risk. Um, on the other hand, taking folks' business licenses away so they can't earn a living it doesn't ultimately foster the long-term goals of the city. There, again, this gets that there are some battles worth fighting and others not. And um, I, we municipalities have tremendous immunity particularly in discretionary functions. No one's forcing you to do this. It's a discretionary choice for you. So my guess is a fight against the city would be an uphill one, but whether we want to incur legal expenses and to do this is another question. So that's kind of where I'd be coming from. Okay. I think you're protected. First, I want to ask Mr. Sutherland to draw us back to the motion on the floor. Okay. Right. This is, a, this is really a point of clarification. We are. Um, we are approving, uh, in eight of these, we're approving decisions by the planning board that have already been sort of moved forward, and they're all tied to lot line changes, nothing about use. This particular uh, agenda item is about lot line changes. So addressing the challenges with the main Department of Offen Defense going into that location is, a, is a, I believe, is a separate conversation. And I don't disagree. Oh. Well, but, but that goes to what my question was, is how did this get through the planning board when they knew that the applicant was the main National Guard? And they obviously they know what that use is, I would, I would hope. Um, but more importantly, they knew what they were doing, being both UNE and the main National Guard, because they understood they were buying, they already merged it when they bought the lot. If you look at the deeds, they took all the lots, merged them as one purchase, and then came to planning board and said, hey, do us a favor and merge these lots. Wasn't that closed in like 2015? 2015 is the yeah. sale. So I mean, sure I, I followed it pretty, pretty closely. In 2014-15 knew about this, and I'm sure the city manager in 2015 knew about this. No, I knew about it, and I had asked several people at that time, but Again, I, I, I wouldn't place this on, on Kevin. I think this lies with no, planning. I think this is prior to Kevin, <clears throat> definitely. Well, I'd like to get back to the order of speakers. So, Councillor Archer is next, and then I'm back over to this side, and I'll start having you in turn. Councillor Archer. Ninth is a one that has been purchased by another applicant. Oh, the applicant is the is the develop is the con in the contract zone. 
but there is a different owner of that lot. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't affect this particular owner f because of decisions by the applicant. I got this. So someone totally new, not connected to the development of this. Correct. Okay, so let me get right. back over to this side before I get, it looks like Councilor Doyle wants to, to speak, but I got three or four people over here. So, who wants to be first? I, well, I have, okay. now I have a question. Councilor Johnston, please. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could, I could write a book, 900 pages <laughs> thick on this, the, these two contract zones. Right. And now I have a question for Kevin and planning on the Ninth Amendment. My understanding is this is Amari Holdings, correct? Don't go too far, Attorney Murphy. <laughs> Th that lot is part of the Cascade contract zone, so why is it now being lumped into the Park North contract zone? There's two separate contract zones. You are correct. And so? And the answer is? I'll be submitting a separate item for ours to go through the process. So I'll, for a first reading on that item, Ninth so Amendment, I'll have as a separate item for you to consider on the first. What about, oh, is that what you were speaking of? Was the Ninth Amendment not the Eighth? The Ninth Amendment is the, is the newest, right. which so, I believe is still before the planning board. Um, they sent it Kate. to council first for approval, right. but that is is part of the contract zone or the Cascade contract zone, not Park North. The, the planning board approved it contingent on council's approval of the Ninth Amendment. So um, I believe Councilor Archer is interested in making the amendment to remove the Ninth Amendment, and we can put the first reading of the Ninth Amendment for July 1st, and then have the public hearing on the 15th. So well, I'll give that to Councilor Johnson since his research he did the research on it. <laughs> so Councilor Johnson, do you want to do you want to make the amendment to remove oh, remove the ninth amendment at Councilor Archer's request and he agrees to second your motion? So moved. Okay. So do we have that down? The amendment number nine is removed. That motion has been made by Councilor Johnston and seconded by Councilor Archer. And, and the idea with this is that the first reading for the Ninth Amendment will occur on July 1st, and the, and the public still hearing. the Ninth Amendment, considering it's no longer an amendment? No, it's not. No, it'll That's just right. Amendment. It'll it be will an be amendment a, to Cascade. It will be a separate amendment on the Cascade Zone. So that's the motion on the floor currently. Uh, is there any comment associated with removing the Ninth Amendment and making it a separate item commentary for the July 1st meeting. Seeing any to my left, any to my right, seeing none. Councillor Archer? Uh, Councillor Gay? Yes. Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Copeland? Count? Yes. Councillor Minthorn? Yes. Councillor Smart? Yes. And Councillor Johnston? Yes. Uh, the motion passes 7-0. We are now considering only the first eight amendments. Um, any additional comment on the eight, eight amendments to my left? Councillor, Councillor Smart, Councillor Minthorn, Councillor Copeland, Councillor Johnston looks like he's all set. So, Councillor Archer, any, Councillor Doyle, you were interested in speaking, none? Okay, so the motion on the floor is to um, approve the first reading of the first eight amendments and to schedule a public hearing for them on July 15th. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Gay? Yes. Councilor Doyle? Yes. Councilor Copeland? Yes. Councilor Minthorn? Yes. Councilor Smart? Yes. And Councilor Johnston? No. The motion passes 6-1. Thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, labeled as C, but it's actually two separate uh, items. The first item will be Councillor Smart. Do you have a motion? You, thank you. Yes, City Council and um, regarding Article 2, Section 2.09, Ordinances and General Posting and Publishing. 
The City Council endeavors to make a few amendments to the Charter, as described in MRSA Title 30A, Chapter 111, Section 2104. The process for making amendments to the Charter requires a public hearing before a vote by the City Council. Additionally, if approved by the Council, the item would be voted in referendum by the public in November. <clears throat> this particular change is meant to add posting of proposed ordinance amendments or new ordinances to the City website and at City Hall for public hearings and adoption of any ordinance as a requirement. In addition, it also saves money on advertising costs by publishing a summary of the proposed ordinance for the public hearing versus the full ordinance and a striking and requirement that the ordinance and striking the requirement that the ordinance be published again for its, after its adoption. Be it ordered that the City Council approves the first reading of the Charter Amendments included in document titled Saco City Charter Amendment Number 1, 2.09 Ordinances in General, Posting and Publishing, dated June 17, 2019, and further moves to schedule a public hearing for July 1, 2019, before a vote to add to the November referendum. Second. So I have a motion by Councilor Smart, seconded by Councilor Menthorn um, to order a public hearing on a charter amendment uh, that amends 2.09 ordinances in general posting and publishing, um, and that the public hearing is all that's required to move this to uh, the November referendum, and that this public hearing will occur on July 1st. Any comments to my right? Any comments to my left? Councillor Johnston? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Only. A vote? Yes. Okay. Councillor Smart? Yes. Councillor Minthorn? Yes. Councillor Copeland? Yes. Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Gay? Yes. And Councillor Archer? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Councillor Johnston, do you have a motion? Page 69. 69. I, I have it here if you'd like to say a point of order. City Council endeavors to make a few amendments to the Charter as described in MSRA Title 30A, Chapter 111, Section 2104. The process for making amendments to the Charter requires a public hearing before a vote by Council. Additionally, if approved by the Council, the item would be voted in referendum by public in November. This particular change is meant to clarify where full versions of the bond order shall be posted. In addition, it also saves money on advertising costs by publishing a summary of the bond order rather than a full version in a daily paper. Having a general circulation in the City of Saco at least two weeks before the final action of the City Council and approval of five members of the City Council. Be it ordered that the City Council approve the first reading of the Charter Amendments, including the document titled Saco City Charter Amendment Number 2, 6.15, Borrowing for Permanent Improvements, Posting and Publishing, dated June 17, 2019, and further move to schedule a public hearing for July 1, 2019, before a vote to add to the November referendum. Second. Second. A uh, motion by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Doyle. Any comments to my right? Any comments to my left? The public hearing is now scheduled, uh, seeing none. Councillor Johnston. Yes. And Councillor Smart. Yes. And Councillor Minthorn. Yes. And Councillor Copeland. Yes. And Councillor Doyle. Yes. And Councillor Gay. Yes. And Councillor Archer. Yes. That motion passes 7-0. There will be a public hearing for this charter change uh, on July 1st. Mr. Mayor. Sir. Point of order. Yes, sir. I'd like to bring back uh, agenda item A for motion to reconsider. Agenda item A, the, that is the passage of, um, of the Park North uh, Contract Zone Amendment. Let me just put to a, uh, a, pardon me. So that was a motion made by you and um, seconded by Councillor Doyle. Yes. I, and you would like, a, and that's a motion to reconsider. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, and you were on the prevailing side in a 5-2 vote, or it was a 5-2 vote and then a 4-3 vote, and I believe you were on the prevailing side for both? Uh, yes, I, I didn't really plan on reading that. I thought Councillor Doyle was going to read it. For you. Okay. Um, and I was going to vote no, but... Oh, then you were going to vote no. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, I have a motion to reconsider by Councillor Gay, uh, reconsider the Park North Contract Zone Amendment from Councillor uh, uh, Gay. Um, there are two motions there. Are you speaking to both of them or just the second one? Uh, both of them. Yes, sir. So, um, is there a second on the motion to reconsider? Second. So, a uh, motion to reconsider made by Councillor Gay and seconded by Councillor Archer. Um, any comments to my right? Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I, we're reconsidering a first reading to just move it on to public hearing where we can then talk about it and have folks come up and talk about it if they're not happy. Uh, right. it, it and, and it still gets a second reading. Right, and I was just gonna point that out that we're, we're, we're still early in the process to be tabling something to uh, avoid public comment. Uh, but, you know, that's just one counselor's opinion. Thank you. Any comments to my left? Councilor Minthorn. I think we ought to just let it go through and let the public hearing be what it is. And if we want to kill it at that point, kill it on that, the second and final. Thank you very much. Any other counselors to my left? Hmm. To, this is the motion to reconsider. <clears throat> While I, I've already publicly stated I'm opposed to this, I would agree in my no vote was it just out of principle, being that I'm going to vote no on the, the second and final, but I would agree with Councilors Doyle and Minthorn that we should just let it go through to the public hearing and then we can, if we choose to, vote it down on the you. second and final. Any additional comments? Withdraw the second. Withdraw the second? Yep. Okay. So are you withdrawing the motion to reconsider? Yes. Okay. So the motion to reconsider and its second have been withdrawn. We are going to move this item on to the public hearing on the 15th of July. And then from there to a second reading where we will, where the council will deal with that as it wishes. So, um, moving on from there, we have the administrative update. Mr. Sutherland. Yes, um, so with the retirement of Ray Demers last week, I've appointed Jack Clements to lead the department through the transition to the next chief. So with that, the police chief position was posted this evening and more of the sites tomorrow. Position will remain posted through July 5th with interviews beginning the week of July 8th. Uh, I've chosen an interview team uh, in having a conversation with the mayor. They will include myself, Human Resources Director Mary Lou Cadillac, Fire Chief John Duras, Council Roger Gay, Community Leader Gene Saunders, and one of the union employees uh, from one of the police department unions that's still to be determined. The interview team will make a decision from my recommend, for my recommendation to council, and as the charter requires, that recommendation will come to council for confirmation. So. Uh, that's the time when council will have an opportunity to confirm the recommendation as the charter states. Thank you very much. Oh, and At the workshop last week, two additional items were discussed regarding goals for myself before uh, my departure. I am, will work, work to put together a merit pay program for your consideration and uh, developing an <coughs> ordinance for no smoking on city property. Those are two additional items that were discussed by the four of us at, or five of us uh, at the workshop last week. Those are my items. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any council comment to my right? Council comment, discussion, any council comment to my left? I see a couple of hands. So we'll start with Councilor Smart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Kate LeBlanc, a uh, seventh grade student um, in the Sebago team at uh, Saco Middle School. Um, she sent us a, a very well-written letter uh, regarding the benefits of uh, riding bikes to cut down on um, emissions. And uh, I wanted to say thank you and that I think we should um, give this a little bit more thought. I know it's come up before and I think uh, we should give it a little more thought. So thank you, Kate. Council Johnston and then Council Mentor. Um, a couple of things. First, former Mayor Pylon was here earlier and he mentioned potentially putting up banners and it made me question whether or not we had posted the elections on all the LED signboards around town. So that was... Yeah. Mr. Sutherland, did we post the election on the two LED signboards? 
Um, I do not know off the top of my head, but I'm certain we did. I'm certain we did. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the train station. I, I can say for certain that it was posted on the signboard at the intersection of Ocean Park Road and Route 1. Oh, okay. And, and it was posted on both. Thank you very much. And the other thing, <clears throat> we had approved the uh, street acceptance tonight. And I would like to add another thing to the administrator's <laughs> list before he leaves us, which is updating Chapter 186 to incorporate that 70 to 80 percent build out as a requirement before we accept any streets of subdivisions. Right now, it seems to be a policy in word and not on paper. Are there any council comments on that particular matter? Seeing none, that would be the consensus of the council, Mr. Sutherland. Next up is uh, Councilor Minthorn. A couple items. One, I, I would like to see, if possible, another councilor and another community member on the police chief's uh, committee. Uh, I think more than one councilor ought to be involved in that activity. Uh, next item. Um, participated Friday in the stupendous transit tournament as well as our city administrator. And uh, I must say he donned a rainbow wig very well for most of the day. Uh, it was, I have pictures. Uh, <laughs> Please don't use uh, those for blackmail. No, not at all. <laughs> no. So uh, it was a very interesting event. Uh, there were a number of elected officials from basically uh, Southern York County all the way up through uh, Central Cumberland County that participated in uh, using the various bus lines, uh, Amtrak, Casco Bay lines, uh, some other different trolleys and whatever throughout the area. I was lucky enough to be on a bus that we went from Saco to Old Orchard round trip and uh, it was a substitute bus so it was already on its last leg and we had enough people on there that evidently the horn wire was being pinched so intermittently it was going off all the way to Old Orchard when we had a full bus and on the way back it stopped which was great because I think the driver had had been given the shiny finger more than one time for the horn going off at a red light. And it, it, it was, I, I, I totally admire the bus driver, his patience given the awkwardness of the situation uh, was just impeccable. I mean, I, I couldn't believe how well he did and how he made fun of it. And uh, it kind of slowly went through the bus as to what was going on and we weren't doing it on purpose and that kind of thing. Uh, we then took an Amtrak ride down to Wells. Uh, I will say that if you want to ride Amtrak, bring your credit card. Uh, the cash process is extremely convoluted, as many people found out, and the credit card works so much easier. Uh, and then finally, we did the Shoreline Explorer, which they actually opened and brought out one of their trolleys for our group of four. Uh, and we had the driver's exclusive time tour, tourist comments. He pointed out several times it wasn't like any trolley at the trolley museum, quote unquote. Uh, in his comments, it was rather colorful. Uh, but uh, it was a great day. Uh, Perry and Carpenter was on the winning team of the tournament, who's uh, one of our folks over at Shuttle Bus. And uh, it was a great event. And uh, I think it really brought a lot of visibility to a lot of elected officials about how we can do more to promote uh, public transportation in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments to my right? Seeing none. Oh, <laughs> Councilor Johnson again. And one last one. Oh, that's uh, okay. I wanted to congratulate both the City Administrator Kevin Sutherland and Emily Roy, our marketing communications specialist, for uh, receiving the Innovator Award from GP Cog at their annual summit, annual summit, for uh, their efforts in innovative communication. Here, here. Okay, thank you. Any other comments to my left and to my right? Seeing none, 
I need a motion to go into executive session. Please read the entire. Be it ordered that the City Council enter into executive session pursuant to MSRA Title I, Chapter 13, Subchapter 1, Section 4056. C, Parks and Recreation Potential Real Estate, Section E, consultation with Council regarding a pending matter. Do I have a second? second. second. Councilor Doyle. I have a motion by Councilor Minthorn, second by Councilor Doyle, to enter into executive session. There are 405, paragraph 6, subparagraph C and E. Any comments to my right? Seeing none, any comments to my left? Seeing none, Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Gay? Yes. Councilor Doyle? Yes. Councilor Copeland? Yes. Councilor Minthorn? Yes. Councilor uh, Smart? Yes. And Councilor Johnston? Yes. The motion passes 7-0. We are now in executive session.